Welcome to Youth for a Secure Water and Climate Future program. Today I'm down here at the Rio Chama near Abiquiu, New Mexico, interviewing Carlos Herrera and Uncle Steve Harris to finger the pulse on New Mexico's water and water policy issues of today. As we head into a, a progressive 2021 legislative session. Sure, I'm uh, 72 years old, so I don't remember some of the things. That uh, seems like I've been involved in this for a long, long time. Uh, yeah, I'm a lifelong resident of New Mexico. I'm 40 years old right now. Um, I'm actually half Cochiti Pueblo and uh, Spanish descent. Uh, I've continued now uh, working in water quality and management for almost 20 years now in various stages. And now, behind us is the beautiful Rio Chama, and, and looking at this river today, uh, at such a great high flow, you wouldn't believe that the river has gone through significant diminishment and degradation. Could you tell us a little bit about those two words and what they mean in the context of New Mexican waters? Uh, degradation uh, refers to lowering the quality of the water. And, um, this is our, our practices, our industrial practices, our agricultural practices. Do we, are we, uh, directly or indirectly uh, introducing toxins into the river. In a lot of cases, human activity is uh, dependent on creating these waste products and uh, expecting. While growing up at Cochiti Pueblo, being one of the first reservations downstream from places such as Los Alamos, I have seen some major impacts that have. But during my time here in New Mexico, one thing that I have seen is a change in the climate. We are now dealing with one of our driest winters on record, I think it was since about 1920. And it seems like there are a lot of different uh, folks, whether they be residents or recreationists, um, or even uh, water and land managers that live around New Mexico that would want to see these things improve. Why haven't they? Well, Western water and uh, changing water policy is sometimes referred to as the Gordian knot. You can't untie it. And one reason is so many people are invested in the way that we are uh, sharing water or not sharing water, competing over water, using water. And uh, vested interests sometimes can uh, stall even a well-meaning uh, progressive campaign to, uh, to make positive change. I see. The way we regard water is the big challenge, is how we think about water. Do we use it deliberately? Do we use it carelessly? Right now we expect it to appear. It's an entitlement. And yet it's the most precious of all the substances to sustaining our life on a lot of levels. Carlos or Steve, have you seen any signs of improvement or uh, any pieces of uh, local policy uh, that have uh, shown a positive change um, for how water could be better managed. Uh, being from Cochiti Pueblo, we have a close tie with our natural resources because we utilize them for things historically, such as making willow baskets that exist along the riparian areas, um, or utilizing some of the different other types of materials to make um, things such as our drum these are part of our culture but this is West. one thing one way that we are able to maintain our connection with that natural resources and by redeveloping that connection between all people with with their natural resources and is another way to be able to improve it one one real driving force to creating better management of our water and the riparian habitats is redeveloping that connection between the human animal and the natural environment out there because then the human sees themselves as merely a part of that environment not being other than the environment and um and then that helps them be included in the whole process of managing that water, taking care of that water, taking care of our riparian areas, because at that point we care about them. So John, to answer your question uh, another way, uh, we can um, improve our management of water quality 
uh, by enacting very strict regulations and, uh, and enforcing those regulations. But I think that Carlos pointed out something that's a, a trend now that I think is very hopeful is that people realizing their connection to each other and to the resource itself can begin to uh, change the way that we govern water so that we're self-regulating. So that's, that's kind of a goal. We're not doing that now. But uh, the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act, was actually quite revolutionary. Right. Act. In 1990, the uh, village of Alamosa, Colorado, which is upstream of us on the Rio Grande, went to tertiary water quality treatment. That means they didn't just discharge the wastewater as it came back through their sewer system. They treated it, and then they retreated it. And as soon as that uh, wastewater plant stopped dumping toxics into the Rio Grande Gorge, we uh, got uh, rid of the non-native uh, uh, crawfish. That were and when we reintroduced otters a few years ago, the otters were able to take off. They had been extirpated because the quality of the water was no good. And now that the water quality has improved, We've got otters gracing our lives in the, in the Rio Grande Gorge, see them playing everywhere. Hierarchy. Now, that's Carlos, with your experience with the tribes, how do tribal authority and tribal governance fit into that picture? Um, the tribes can actually develop water quality regulations that are even more stringent than the states that they are embodied within. And so by tribes developing stringent water quality standards, they can have an impact on the state or the surrounding communities around them. There, a lot of it comes to the way that people think about the natural resources. Is it something that we need to go out there and grab as much as we can? Or is it something that we should acknowledge that has the right to exist that has the right to be able to live? Does this water have the right to live? Do these trees have the right to live? And is there anything that we can do through regulations and laws that can provide some kind of protection for the water, for the land, for the natural resources, so that they can, that they can continue to have the right to exist? Go ahead. It's just the idea of calling a river a resource kind of um, tends to commodify it. It tends to not um, account for the, the spiritual dimension of it all and the, uh, and the biological dimension, the fact that there are creatures whose lives matter that we can't even see under the surface of the water who are, who are impacted by this. It, it's, it's not a resource for them. It is life itself. Carlos, what uh, what bills are you excited about? Uh, one of the uh, exciting bills or uh, memorials that I've heard proposed includes something called the Green Amendment to the state's Bill of Rights that provides the right of water and ecosystems such as air and climate and preservation of natural uh, culture and um, scientific and healthful qualities of the environment so it almost like you giving those uh the environment a chance to exist so that the green amendment does sound awesome and it's even more awesome magnified by this beautiful landscape uh like many of which that would reserve or, or would get additional protections uh under legislation like this in new mexico carlos anything else um, another one that was exciting for me from a Native American perspective was one that has not been listed yet, but it's uh, asking for the ability to be able to develop water connections for the Navajo Nation. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else about this legislative session that, uh, that makes it different from years past? I think the most interesting thing about it is that it's going to be conducted remotely. They had a little rehearsal when they did a special session earlier in the uh, pandemic, and so uh, it makes it hard for industry lobbyists and citizens alike to get into the building and have discussions with their legislators, and I think... Uh, it offers us a chance to be creative in how we communicate with, with legislators. Now, uh, one last question before we uh, sign off. 
uh, to our, our students who are listening at home, if you were in their shoes, if, if you were a, uh, a high school aged uh, Steve and Carlos with everything that you've learned over the course of your career, um, how could you um, take steps to make your voices uh, louder during the legislative session? Uh, understanding your issue uh, is very important. I think that's step one. Um, remember not to, uh, you don't have to give a sales pitch. You're, you're not selling an idea. You're using persuasive speech. So to have good arguments, well-reasoned, uh, well-sourced, focus in on the policy. What's the policy need? And then what is a solution that you're proposing? And what, what would that That's, do? I think. Um, well, I think one thing that a student needs or can provide to the legislators is to be able to develop a personal connection to the bill that they are proposing either be supported or not supported. And if they provide some kind of personal connection from their community, from their home, from the places that they come from, it comes more from the heart. My belief in the management of natural resources is that we are living on borrowed time. The time that we are borrowing right now is from our next generation, from our youth, from our kids because one day we are going to be no longer on this earth and it's going to be up to them to be able to manage the natural resources, the water, the forest, their watersheds. And so by putting their voice out there, it tells them that, hey, this is how we want our resources to be managed, not for your guys' good, but for our good for the future generation. Uh, this is Jonathan Terrell signing off from Abiquiu, New Mexico, reminding our students and the youth for a secure water and climate future to amplify your voices and make them heard in the 2021 legislative session. Uh -uh. Oh, Montgomery Ward's a whole way ahead. Hey, oh. oh, Montgomery Ward's a whole way ahead. Hey, oh. Side combs, bath combs, ribbons, that's what they are giving us. Yeah, a whole right way ahead. Hey, 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 oh.